Thank you very much, Tim. So it's a pleasure to, to be here and to be able to tell you about this work that was completed uh, about six months ago and appeared in, uh, more than six months, about a year ago and appeared in APJ earlier this year. So this was a project using data that I, I wasn't involved in the taking of or even proposing to take it. There was a group at uh, Max Planck Institute led by all, at Heidelberg, all led by Oliver Krauss that proposed for a time on the Herschel Space Observatory to observe Andromeda. They got the time, they did observations, they wrote a paper on it, and then they, they thought there might be more analysis possible, and they invited me to, to join them in writing a paper analyzing and modeling the infrared emission they saw. So th this is the, the cast of uh, participants here. So uh, very important was Gonzalo, which is the, latest, the red button. So very important participant here was Gonzalo Anyano, graduate student at Princeton at the time when we were starting this because there was a lot of work involved in processing the data itself before we could even do the dust modeling. And he did a fantastic job on that. So here's the, the Max Planck group, uh, Oliver Krauss and others. And then in addition, we brought in Robert Brown uh, because he was the expert on 21 centimeter observations of Andromeda and Ad Adam Leroy as an expert on CO observations of Andromeda because most of, the paper, most of this talk is going to be about the dust in Andromeda but a very, to me, a very interesting uh, thing to relate the dust to is the gas and to see what the dust to gas ratio is as a function of position in Andromeda. So we wanted to make sure that we were doing a good job on analyzing the existing gas data. Okay, so that, anyway, that's a beautiful picture of Andromeda. When you go looking for beautiful pictures of Andromeda, I'm sure that Subaru is supposed to, is, has a very nice one, but when you go looking for nice pictures, the nicest ones to my eye are the ones made by amateurs. So this is one made by an amateur, uh, Robert uh, Gendler made available on the web, provide, you know, give him credit for it, but it's, it's, a, it's a mosaic made of many images uh, using his, his uh, personal telescope, and he's done a fantastic job. So it's a very wide field view. <coughs> okay, so here is uh, the main list of the main results. So I'm putting these, them up here so you can sort of figure out whether I'm persuading you along the way of uh, being convinced of any of them. So we're go I'm gonna show you a map that purports to be a map of the surface density of dust in Andromeda extending out to at least 20 kiloparsecs from the center as a map, as a two-dimensional map. Then actually if we integrate an annuli so that we can work in regions of lower surface brightness we can, and raise, raise the signal to noise by averaging, we can, I think, make credible statements all the way out to 25 kiloparsecs from the center of Andromeda. It's quite far out. Uh, when we do that and we compare with the gas, we find a large gradient in the dust to gas ratio. So the dust to gas ratio in the center of Andromeda is almost 10 times higher than the dust to gas ratio in the outer edges, and it's a smooth function of radius as you move out. The dust to gas ratio, when we look at it as a function of radius, we discover that as far as we can tell, it's basically tracking the metallicity of the gas. So again, something I hope to persuade you of. When the metallicity, in the part of Andromeda where the metallicity is close to what the metallicity is around us in the galaxy, namely about the metallicity of the sun, where we measure the dust to gas ratio locally to be about 0.9% of the dust is the ratio of dust mass to hydrogen mass locally. It looks like Andromeda has about the same value in the part of Andromeda where the metallicity is, is about solar. The very center of Andromeda, we're able to test the dust model in a new way because we actually know what the starlight radiation field is that's heating the dust there. And so we have one thing that we don't have as a free parameter, that we do have as a free parameter elsewhere in the galaxy. We're not free to vary that parameter in the center of Andromeda, so it's an extra test on the dust model. The dust model actually turns out to, to pass the test pretty well. I'm probably not going to say anything about this as a, because of lack of time, so I'll skip this. It has to do with the we do seem to see systematic variations in the dust properties in Andromeda, but uh, ask me about that later. The polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, they are an important component of a dust model, and we can estimate the ratio of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons to the rest of the dust mass, and we find that, to me, surprisingly, uh, turned out to be relatively constant in Andromeda after we do the best job we can for correcting for variations in the starlight in the color of the starlight, which is heating the dust. And finally, uh, the bottom line is that the, the pH fraction is a fraction of the dust mass is about 4% across Andromeda in the regions where we have good enough signal to noise to measure it, and that's close to what we think the, val the value is in the solar neighborhood. Tim. A really quick question on your dust data. Do you think 
that you can say with any kind of significance that this value is not consistent with the Milky Way value of whatever it is, 1.7, 1.8? Uh, well, yes, if the, if the photometry is as accurate as, we as it is claimed to be, I think the answer is yes, that it doesn't fit well there. I also, I haven't listed it here, but, but listed uh, here on the, on the list of topics, but I will show you Planck data at the end to show that the dust model actually agrees with the Planck data out to very long wavelengths. Okay, so back to an optical picture of Andromeda, so you're all familiar with this, so and Andromeda, uh, and then the companion galaxies, uh, M32 and NGC 205, they are not going to be part of this story. Uh, M32 has virtually no dust in it, so even though it's in our images, you don't see it in the infrared. It's just stars. Um, and this is outside the field of view that we, that we analyze. But you can obviously see uh, clear evidences of dust in the optical photograph. There are dust lanes here where the, the light of the stars is dimmed by obscuration by dust between us and the stars. Okay, now I'm going to tilt that around and put north up. So this will be the standard orientation of all the images that I'm going to show you. North is up, uh, east is uh, to the left. And that's the optical image of Andromeda. Why do we study it? Well, it's the nearest large spiral. So the, the, the Magellanic Clouds are both peculiar galaxies. M31 is a more closer to our idea, of, our idea of what a normal spiral galaxy is going to look like. And it's the closest one to study. So we can observe things in fairly good uh, with fairly good spatial resolution in Andromeda. Uh, just to remind you that the mass of Andromeda, it's, it's a healthy sized galaxy. It's about 10 to the 12 solar masses of dark of, of matter, uh, mostly dark matter providing the gravitational potential. About 10 to the 11 solar masses of stars, according to the latest estimates of the star, the star comp stellar composition of the galaxy. And a little less than 10 to the 10 solar masses of, of interstellar medium, gas and dust. The interstellar medium, I'll remind you, is primarily hydrogen. The hydrogen is primarily atomic and molecular, primarily atomic at M31, a substantial amount of molecular gas, but more atomic than molecular. Uh, there'd be some ionized gas present. It doesn't seem to be a very large part of the, of the gas inventory. We don't look for the ionized gas. We will just talk about 21 centimeter observations of the H1 and carbon monoxide as a tracer of the molecular hydrogen and assume that we're not missing very much uh, when we don't discuss the ionized component. Uh, the dust is overall about the same fraction of the dust to, uh, of the mass as it is in the Milky Way. And uh, why do we study the dust? Well, I don't need to remind you. It's an important player of the interstellar medium. It controls the chemistry the, and it plays an important role in the ionization balance in some regions. It's, of course, very important for radiator transfer. Um, it's dynamically important. It couples radiation pressure to, to it allows radiation to exert a, a force on, on gas that is dusty. Um, it couples to the magnetic field in regions that are very neutral. Often the coupling to the magnetic field can even be predominantly through the charged the charge dust grains, which then have a get drag force on the, on the neutral, on the gas around, on the majority neutral gas. Well, there's probably, there's definitely some hydrogen in the dust, but it's mostly heavy, heavy elements, the refractory, you know, silicon, magnesium, iron, some oxygen, some carbon, substantial amount of carbon. Okay, but the main reason to study it is because we're curious. We'd like to know what it's made of, how it works. Okay, so what's the, what are the data on which we will be relying? Well, before Herschel, Spitzer, the Spitzer Space Telescope had already done a complete imaging uh, campaign on Andromeda. <clears throat> and so the two, the two cameras on Spitzer Space Telescope are the IRAC camera with four bands in the, in the near infrared and the MIPS camera with uh, three bands at longer wa infrared wavelengths. So we use these public data sets. Um, and then, as I said, the uh, group led by Oliver Krauss proposed for observing time on Herschel and was granted observing time. Uh, strangely enough, the Time Allocation Committee on Herschel also gave a complete set of observing uh, 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 time to, for a complete set of observations of Andromeda to another group. So there's another data set in her, in, uh, taken with Herschel that we will not have, we're not using here. In the future, one could imagine combining them with, our with the data set that Krauss et al. obtained to get even better signal to noise. <clears throat> but anyway, these observations were carried out with, again, with all of the imaging capabilities of, of Herschel, the, the PAX camera with three bands and the spiral camera with three more bands going all the way out to 500 microns. So we have data running from 3.6 microns where you're basically seeing starlight out to 500 microns where you're seeing very long wavelength emission from the dust. Then there was a, whoops, sorry, what happened here? 
Yeah, so West, Westerbork, uh, 21 centimeter uh, interferometric observations by Brown et al. have very, quite good angular resolution on Andromeda, quite deep, so they see uh, atomic hydrogen out to uh, relatively low surface brightnesses. And then IRAM has a, has a map of the central parts of Andromeda. It doesn't cover all of Andromeda, but there's very little molecular, out at the edges of this map, the molecular signal is getting very weak. So they're not missing much molecular gas by uh, restricting this image to only the central 11 kiloparsecs or so. So this is a public data set that we used. Now, all of these images come with background. So we're looking at Andromeda through the Milky Way, and it's a relatively low, it's not an extremely high galactic latitude. So the Milky Way foreground is, sub is substantial. And because Andromeda is so, so big, there can be foreground variations due to the Milky Way. So that's, you, you can't assume that it's going to necessarily be a, a uniform surface brightness contribution from the Milky Way foreground that you can subtract. So you want to do your best job of, of determining what the background level is, the emission that's not coming from Andromeda and then subtract that off in all of the images. And Gonzalo devised automated techniques for recognizing, figuring out what the proper level of background is and doing a quite good job of subtracting it. Uh, it worked quite well in all the bands except two. There's still artifacts left in, the, in two of the IRAC bands that we couldn't figure out how to get rid of and it's not clear whether it was just some instrumental issue uh, or whether one could have a more sophisticated job of background estima estimation. Perhaps there's more structure in the Milky Way foreground in those two particular bands than there are in the other bands that we worked with. Okay, so here are, the image, here are two images. The optical image I showed you before, and then to the, same, to the same angular scale, one of the images that we had, this is an image taken with Herschel at 350 microns. It's the raw, the raw image after subtracting uh, the background um, at the native resolution of, of Herschel, a 3.5 meter telescope, diffraction limited at 350 microns. So you can see beautiful structure here. Uh, this is a mat, this is a color, color bar showing the surface brightness in the band, in the 350 micron band. And you can see that we can follow emission in the galaxy way out to the outer parts here where the optical image is getting, you know, quite faint. And you can see one-to-one -one correspondences between uh, structures in the optical image where the dust lane is present here and a dust line, you know, the infrared emission is bright where the dust lanes are present. Now, when I f saw this image for the first time after the background subtraction was done, I thought, oh my goodness, you know, we, we definitely have a problem. Oh, I should say, what are the, the scales here? This smooth, the, the smooth elliptical annulus here is a 20 kiloparsec ring at the tilt that we think Andromeda has. Now, Andromeda doesn't have one tilt, but at the best, the best overall tilt for the, di for the disk plane of Andromeda. So we're seeing emission out to 20 kiloparsecs up in the northeastern part of the galaxy. Down in the southwestern part of the galaxy, well, it looks like, you know, we've got some problem there. Maybe we've over-subtracted the background. So when I first saw this image, I thought, well, it looks like we're not going to be able to work out as far as we could because there are some issues with background estimation here. I'll show you that this is actually real. This is not a problem with our background estimation. There really is a deficiency of emission in that south, uh, southwestern corner of the galaxy. The irregular contour here has been, has been drawn to tell you it encloses the, the region in the galaxy where the pixels have, individual pixels have surface brightnesses expressed in total infrared emission per, total infrared luminosity per unit area, which we've, which are above a threshold value here, which we've set at a one and a half million solar luminosities per square kiloparsec on the sky plane at the distance, at, well, at, on the sky plane at the distance of Andromeda, that's a surface brightness where we feel the signal to noise in one pixel is high enough that we could do a credible job of estimating the dust properties in that pixel, in a single pixel at 350 micron resolution. So, how big are the pixels? Um, it's unfortunately I don't remember the number, but it's something like 70 parsecs. So they're, they're or maybe 100 parsecs. They're relative, you know, they're large. A lot of stuff in that in the galaxy within that scale, but a relatively small pixel on the uh, scale of the galaxy. So I may have that number on another slide here. I don't trust my memory on it. Um, okay, so here is uh, now we have another issue that when we're going to do the modeling on, we want to do this on a single pixel basis, but of course the pixels for the different telescopes are all quite different in size. And if we want to get correct colors for an individual pixel, 
then we have to do everything at a common resolution. So we have to decide what angular resolution we're going to work at, and then only use data that is at that angular resolution, that was taken at that angular resolution or better. And if the angular resolution of the data is better, then we have to convolve it down to the angular resolution that we're choosing to work at. So we're going to do two different angular resolutions. And that we had to do two because we wanted to persuade ourselves that we weren't going to see the results depending upon the angular resolution that we did. So we chose two different angular resolutions. One would be the angular resolution of the image that I showed you, the Spire 350 micron camera with a full width half maximum of 25 arc seconds. Now, when we do that, we are not able to use lower resolution data. So there are two important data sets, the Spire 500 micron data. Well, if we're going to work at the 350 micron resolution, we just set that aside and don't touch it. And the MIPS 160 micron camera, which because the Spitzer telescope was smaller than uh, Herschel, again, doesn't have good enough angular res resolution. So we throw away two of the data sets, and we work with the remaining ones. Or we can. Well, we, tr we do our best job that we can. It's obviously never perfect, but uh, we've done as good a job we can. And you could judge how, how, to what low surface brightnesses the results still look believable. Then the other choice we can make is say, well, we're gonna, we want to use all the data. We want to have maximum sensitivity, so we'll go with the lowest resolution camera, the MIPS 160 resolution, and then convolve all the other data, all the other images to the MIPS 160 resolution. Now we're going to go from a resolution of 25 arc seconds to about 39 arc seconds full width half maximum. Um, in both cases, we're going to use redundant information, or what should be redundant information at 70 microns, where the MIP, or Spitzer had a camera with a band centered at 70 microns, PAX had a camera centered at 70 microns. You might say, well, PAX is newer and at better angular resolution, and it's a bigger telescope, why use Spitzer? Well, the problem is the two images, the, the, the imaging by the two by the two cameras, it doesn't seem to be perfectly consistent. If you convolve down the Spitzer image to the, rather the convolve the, the, the PAX image to the Spitzer resolution, you don't get images which are identical. There are some issues with, the, with one or both of the cameras. Each team insists, of course, that their camera work fine. Um, <laughs> when I'm in that situation and I don't see any reason to, to favor one or the other, we decide we'd better to use both data sets. We'll be somewhere in the middle. We won't be too far off uh, if we, if we uh, introduce them both. And when we're working at MIPS 160 resolution, we also do the, we use MIPS 160 as well as PAX 160. Remember, Spitzer had some advantages. Despite being a smaller telescope, it was all cryogenic. The optics in Spitzer were all cold. Herschel had warm optics, I mean, you know, cooled radiatively. It had cryogenic detectors, but the optics were warm. So there, you know, the, the, the ability to work at low surface brightnesses, it's not obvious that Herschel had the advantage uh, just because it was larger. OK, now we're going to use a dust model to try to reproduce what we see. I don't want to spend very much time talking to you about the model. I'd love to, but uh, I'll just give you the outlines here. <clears throat> it's a model that's, that, set, that adopts the point of view that we're going to try to model what we see in terms of a dust population that consists of carbonaceous dust and, amorph and amorphous silicate dust, each with a size distribution. The carbonaceous dust, when the particles are large, for want of knowing exactly what we ac have actually out there, we're going to use the optical constants of graphite, because that's a material that we, can we have laboratory measurements on at a over a wide range of energies. And for when the, graph when the carbonaceous particles are small, then we give them the character of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons and use a model to describe the, 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 uh, the, the cross-section for polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons as in the various bands in which they can emit and absorb in the infrared. So it's, it's a sort of empirical model for the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons that has been guided to be both consistent with what we know about a few particular polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon molecules based on laboratory or theoretical work, but we actually only know about a few of them in, in terms of specific measurements in the lab. And we're just, you can assume that the mix of stuff we have in the galaxy is we're going to adopt optical constants that seem to reproduce the data on the average and which are co compatible with what we know in the laboratory. So it's not, we're not doing anything which does violence to what is known about laboratory pHs, but the laboratory, any individual laboratory pH will not reproduce 
what we have. So that's, that's the physical characteristics of the dust that we put in. Each, the dust particles have size distributions. We assume, again, we're going to just use size distributions that reproduce the local average measured extinction curve from the for overall wavelengths where we can measure it. So that constrains the size distribution of both the silicate and the carbonaceous particles. Now, the particles in Andromeda don't have to have the same size distribution they have here, so we're making, a, you know, we're making quite a leap, and let's see how well it works. Now, for the infrared, it doesn't matter all that much what the size distribution is, except for the particles that are so small that they fluctuate in temperatures. Yes? Do you think something for the resolution is different in the carbon uh, dust, or do we use the specific parameters? Well, we, because if we had information that was sensitive to that ratio, we would have it as a free parameter. But we're just looking at the integrated infrared emission, and the only thing which really stands out as material specific are the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon emission features. So that we do have as a free parameter. In each pixel of Andromeda, as we'll see, we allow ourselves to vary the polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbon content, but the rest of the carbonaceous grains, the ratio of the carbonaceous to the silicate is held as, at a fixed number that is the same as the value that we would use to model the local dust. So again, that, no reason to think that that has to be true as you're going. Well, if you had 10 micron spectroscopy, the, uh, if you had background sources that you could see in absorption at 10 microns, then you'd have a lovely way of constraining the silicate population. But that's, we don't have that. You know, that's a rare, rare thing. You need bright background sources and relatively large amount of dust in front of it to do 10 micron absorption line spectroscopy. When you have that, then you, you have a lot of information about the silicates. Okay, so uh, the starlight, which is heating, an important part of the model is the starlight, which is heating the dust, because we're observing infrared emission. Why, do the, why are the grains warm in the first place? Because they're being heated by absorbing starlight. The rate at which the particles are heated depends upon the optical properties of the particles, which we're calculating as I've described, but it also depends upon the radiation field, which is heating the particles. We don't know very much about the spectrum, how the spectrum in the radiation field might vary from place to place. We know that it varies from place to place. It's got to, you know. Sometimes you're near hot stars. Sometimes you're in heavily reddened regions, and you only have the longer wavelengths present. Uh, but we're not going to do a radiative transfer model for Andromeda. Nobody can do that at this point, because it requires extreme assumptions about the three-dimensional distribution of both the stars that are the source of the starlight and the dust which is attenuating it. So we just assume a uniform spectrum everywhere, and we take that spectrum to be the, the spectrum that we think appropriate to the local interstellar medium. Um, and then we just scale up the intensities, or scale up or down the intensities to try to reproduce the overall heating rates that we observe. So again, we do that everywhere except at the center of Andromeda, where we actually know what the starlight is, and I'll, I'll, I'll come to that in a bit. So. Um, I think I'm, gonna j I'm spending too much time on this slide here. I'm just going to jump ahead, and, and all of this will be intuitively clear, I think. So here's a day in the life uh, of, of interstellar grains in two different radiation fields. So there are five different grains here, sizes ranging from 10 angstrom radius with about 500 atoms in it up to a 200 angstrom radius uh, with uh, many more atoms uh, in it, just proportional to radius cubed. Um, and this would be what the temperature, if you had a thermometer attached to the grain and you measured its temperature as a function of time, what would it look like? Well, this grain down here in the course of a day it doesn't absorb a photon and it's very cold and it's, it's in its ground vibrational state. So it's hard to talk about what its vibrational temperature is. It's just sitting there in the vibrational ground state. If you go to a, a larger grain, it now has a large enough cross section that in the course of the day, by chance, it does absorb one starlight photon. It's got a small enough heat capacity that that starlight photon can now heat the grain up from the vibrational ground state up to a vibrationally excited level that would, uh, that would correspond to being at a temperature of about 50 degrees Kelvin. And it then begins to cool by infrared emission. And it doesn't cool instantaneously. It takes a matter of you know, hundreds or thousands of seconds to cool back down and end up in the vibrational ground state below the, you know, off, off the bottom of this chart here. As the particles increase in size, the frequency of events increases, but of course the spikes decrease because the heat capacity is going up. And finally, when you get up to a particle that's 200 angstroms in size, this is all I should say for the starlight intensity of the local solar neighborhood. That's what this parameter U means. We're scaling the starlight intensity relative to the uh, value that we think is uh, appropriate for the local uh, ISM. And once you get up to a few hundred angstroms in size, the fluctuations are still there, but you'd be happy to say, oh, I can disregard them. They're not very extreme. 
the grain is basically sitting there at, an, at a steady temperature of about 20 degrees Kelvin. And if you increase the starlight intensity by a factor of 100, then of course all the events here increase in frequency by 100. So even the smallest grain here is now undergoing, happens to have a, you know, order 10 excursions a day. And the bigger grain is hotter with very small fluctuations present in its, uh, in its temperature as a function of time. So, so that's the story of what individual grains would do. But now we've got a population out there, and we want to estimate the, inter the infrared emission from that population. So what do we have to do? We have to take all the elements of our population. Of course, we discretize. We don't do continuous integrations over size. We break up the size distribution into a number of bins, a large number of bins. And then for each size bin, we say, OK, for a grain of that size in the radiation field that I'm considering, what is going to be the temperature distribution function? So I have to solve the stochastic heating problem of what, on the average, would be the probability of finding the grain in different energy levels. Um, do that for each grain size and each grain composition. And once I've got that, then I assume the emission from the grain at any instant will be basically thermal emission. Even the smallest pHs have enough internal degrees of freedom that when they are hot and radiating, you can essentially treat them as thermal. It's not, they're not really in contact with a heat bath, so it's not exactly a Maxwellian distribution. But we've tested that assumption and found that assuming a thermal distribution for the emission is a very good assumption. Tested it theoretically. Uh, tested it theoretically by doing the discrete problem and saying, OK, let's suppose we actually do this, a state-by-state -state analysis. How much difference do we see? And the answer is once, the, once we get up to the sizes of the things that are the smallest pHs that we think can survive, the thermal assumption is quite good. So, um, so we do that. We integrate over the, over the probability distribution uh, of temperatures and get an emission spectrum. And here's some sample emission spectra where we've now integrated over the size distribution and over the two composition, the, the carbonaceous and, and silicate grains. And if you have a starlight intensity that's 10% of the local value, then the emission spectrum here, ex here expressed as power per logarithmic interval, and in all cases normalized so that all of these curves um, have, are scaled, according, scaled up or down according to the starlight intensity U, so they all look about the same. The peak emission here is out about you know, 200 or so microns. Um, as we raise the intensity of the radiation field to, by, by factors of 10, this emission peak at long, at long wavelengths begins to uh, march towards shorter wavelengths, just as you'd expect. The dust is getting hotter. Now, at short wavelengths, we have a nearly invariant spectrum here. That's the emission of the pHs in discrete vibrational features. Why does that not change? Well, because it's just single photon heating with the single photon events being more and more frequent. But the distribution of temperatures that you get from each event doesn't depend upon how often the events are occurring because the grains are cooling down almost to their vibrational ground state before the next photon absorption occurs. So, over a large range of intensities, the, the shape of the pH emission spectrum here and the relative strength of the different bands doesn't change. It's only when you get to extremely high intensities of 100,000 or a million times the local starlight value do, be, do you begin to see much of an effect. So that's a nice feature. It's, it's also consistent with the fact that the pH emission spectrum in, in galaxies is found to be surprisingly constant, even in galaxies where the dust is warmer or cooler. OK, so we do the modeling here. And we do it for these two different data sets, either the Spira the 350 resolution or the MIPS 160 resolution. Um, as I said, we use both 70 micron data sets. And uh, if we low lower resolution one, we can use the MIPS 160 data as well. And then every single pixel, we have a number of free parameters. So one free parameter is the starlight. At the shortest wavelengths, 3.6 microns, you're primarily looking at the stars in, in, the, in the pixel. The dust is not radiating appreciably in that band. And so if you want to do a multi-wavelength imaging, and in, including the shorter IRAC bands, you want to have a starlight component. We just assume a 5,000 degree black body will be adequate for modeling the starlight at these long wavelengths. Um, and, but we have a surface brightness that we can adjust up or down. So that's one parameter. Then, we, as I said, we have, we're assuming a universal ratio of, of silicates to carbonaceous grains. But we don't know how much dust is in the pixel. So obviously, another uh, adjustable parameter is going to be the total surface density of dust in that pixel. Now, we don't know how much starlight is present in that pixel. So we have to model a starlight intensity distribution. And we're using a, 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 a distribution of starlight intensities 
but most of the starlight heating is being, being done by starlight at something we call U, at intensity U min, which we interpret as being the starlight and the diffuse interstellar medium of that pixel, with a small probability of, of some of the fraction of the grains exposed to higher intensity yes. starlights. I don't want to describe these parameters because I don't have time right now, but we have a, a, three parameters adjusting our distribution, but in fact, one of them, if we held it fixed, the results would be almost the same. So sort of how many parameters we have is really one, two, three, four, five. We have a six parameter, but if I, if I fixed it, the results would not change. So we have six parameters, and we have 11 infrared bands, two of which we ha may have redundant data in. So we're well constrained in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of the model. So at 3.6 microns, the starlight surface brightness sort of nails that. Yeah, it nails that. And really, the 4.5 is also basically starlight. So is, we basically do that to know how much starlight to, to subtract at the longer wavelengths. We're not really interested in the starlight except to get it out of the 6 and 8 mi and, and even 24 micron images. It's, yeah, this, 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 and this are, are separate. Now, you might say, well, why are you treating them separately? But they are separate things. One of them is we're looking face on at the galaxy. More, well, not really face on, but. We're, and the other one is how much starlight are the dust grains seeing inside the galaxy? Now, there's obviously, these things are not unrelated, but they're not directly related either, unless you make assumptions about the large scale geometry of the galaxy. Well, each grain is radiating independently of the others. Um, well, the, the, what happens is the grain, the grain, which is a collection of many atoms, maybe a million, maybe 10 to the eighth atoms in a grain, um, absorb a starlight photon. That energy, we assume, goes all into internal excitations, vibrational excitations of the grain. And then it stays in these vibrational excitations until the grain can radiate the energy away through its vibrational emission, optically active vibrational emission, uh, vi vibrational it's modes. Vibration. It's basically vibrations that we're looking at. We're not looking at electronic transitions. Electronic transition is the initial photon absorption. That excites an electronic state, which then is quickly de-excited by internal processes in the grain to put the energy into vibrations. OK, so that's the modeling procedure. And how do we do here? So this, oh, this is just to show you the effects of resolution. So this is uh, the Spire 350 resolution image that I showed you previously. If I take this image and I convolve it to the resolution of the MIPS instrument which in order to do the low resolution imaging, how much information do we lose? Well, the answer is not a lot. If you look, you can see details here that get blurred out when you come over here. But basically, the large structural elements of the galaxy are perfectly clear at what we're calling low resolution modeling. So low resolution modeling is still very nice uh, angular resolution. In terms of the size of the pixel, the 350 micron pixel is 90 parsecs on the side. Uh, at a full width half maximum is 90 parsecs. The pixels are actually smaller. And the MIPS 160 is 140 parsecs. So we're at the 100 parsec resolution level. Well, yeah, it's not clear whether you would call this a, spir a spiral if you looked at this pattern. It's often, these are often described as rings. So it, this is definitely not a grand design spiral, but I'll defer discussion of the, of the spiral density wave application to Andromeda to somebody else. So Scott can tell you all about it. That's the question I was just going to ask. <laughs> <laughs> OK, so here's just where the infrared luminosity is. So the galaxy is quite bright at the center. Very, very infrared luminous at the center, and very much a ring-like structure here. So what we've done, in order to get a radial distribution here, we just said, well, let's just an average in annuli. So if we take this image and we an average over annuli here that are equal with annuli, but you know, at the inclination of, of the displane of Andromeda, and then extract the, the information here and ask, what would be the surface brightness of Andromeda if we were looking down, normal, you know, normal to the galaxy? This is the infrared surface brightness per unit area. It peaks at the, very, at the very center. It's relatively constant out to about 10 kiloparsecs, and then declines more or less as an exponential, uh, an exponential would des describe the decline pretty well, all the way out to about 25 kiloparsecs. Now, I'm showing you three sets of symbols here. 
The S350, the, the, tri the blue triangles here, is taking the individual pixels that were modeled at S350, Spire 350 resolution, and then summing up the contributions of each pixel that fall within an annulus. The red triangles is doing the same thing, but using the larger pixels and, you, and now basing each pixel on all of the data. Uh, but the black circles here are saying, no, 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 let's just take, let's just take annuli sum up all the flux, treat the annulus as a pixel in a sense, sum up all the flux in, in the annulus, and then ask what kind of model of how much dust, et cetera, do we need to reproduce the emission from that annulus. That has the advantage that we get out to the fainter regions. We can sum over air, pixels where the individual pixels are not, don't have a high enough surface brightness to do a realistic modeling. Here is a fra uh, this plot here shows the fraction of the pixels at each galactocentric radius that are above our threshold for modeling. It's 100% out to about 15 kiloparsecs. But we, when we get out to 16 kiloparsecs, some of the pixels are now falling below our threshold. Sometimes that's just due to noise fluctuations happening to take you know, one of the cameras down. But that fraction goes down, 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 and, and we get out to 25 kiloparsecs. Individual pixels are only about you know, 10% of them are getting above our threshold. But that doesn't mean there's no emission out there. It just means it's less than one and a half million solar luminosities per square, square kiloparsec. So it would be more reliable to discuss the outer parts in terms of the, uh, the, the results gotten from just integrating over the annulus. So notice the annular integration looks quite uh, smooth out here in the surface brightness distribution. So the image here? Yes. yes. Uh, 3.1 kiloparsecs for the luminosity. You know, the dust surface density would have a different, because also the starlight intensity is also varying here. Was there? Yeah, just moving on. Could, could you separate out like the luminosity from the M stars versus the O stars? Because you did separately, you know, you had the luminosity and the surface brightness. Yeah, this is only the dust surface brightness, so right, right, not the stellar, and we didn't, we didn't try to, to decompose the stellar populations. In principle, there's information, yeah. So that's another another project. We didn't we didn't undertake that. Pardon me. Well, things are just disappearing into the noise here. But you know, the green is, the green levels here are probably significant. So we're seeing emission from individual patches that are you know out beyond 20 kiloparsec. As we see, we integrate up here in the annuli. We're seeing emission out to 25. Um, and, you know, there do seem to be three peaks here at about 5.6, 11.2, and 15.1 kiloparsecs where the surface brightness goes up a little bit. And that corresponds, you can find those, you can find these features here. You know, here's the 15, kil 15 kiloparsec bump there is coming from this thing. Here's the 11 kiloparsec, and here's 5.6 kiloparsec. So when Tim. you say annuli, you're still doing the modeling pixel by pixel? No. When oh, we do so the annulus, we treat the annulus as one as big one pixel, pixel for the for modeling purposes. We sum up the luminosities, and so that yeah. enables the signal to noise okay. uh, to be greatly improved. Now I can't see the time here. Yeah. Okay, so um, now that model, the model that we, I just showed you the infra, in the infrared emission. That's sort of just an observable. So we're summing up the luminosity in the infrared after subtracting the starlight contribution uh, in, in the shorter wavelength bands. Now we're coming to the results of the modeling here. So in the same, with the same set of pixels, the 350 micron resolution pixels, the MIPS 160 resolution pixels, or the annual averaging, we've taken, we've, here at, with the 350 micron, I'm showing you a 350 micron resolution map here of the, of the dust surface density, just died. No, there we go. The, uh, of the dust surface density now in solar masses per square kilo, log solar masses per square kiloparsec. So the highest dust surface densities here are a million solar masses of dust per square kiloparsec. And the lowest ones you can detect are getting down to, well, you decide where your threshold here, here is, maybe the green stuff. So 10 to the 4 and a half or so uh, solar masses of dust per square kiloparsec. So we've got a dynamic range here of almost a factor of 100 in dust surface density from the highest values that we see uh, to the lowest values that we could model in a single pixel. Now, again, we seem to have this, this hole here where there's missing stuff that if you look up here, 
we fill this uh, 20 kiloparsec ellipse all the way out to the edge with detectable emission. Down here, we have this low surface brightness uh, region, which, as I said, worried me very much when we first saw that. Now, we do the dust, the dust modeling in the same, extract the pixels here and treat them, extract, make radial profiles as we did, did with, solar, with the luminosity. Now we see the dust surface density is very low at the center. So the center was very bright in infrared luminosity. It doesn't actually have very much dust there. It just happens to be very hot. So there's a, a real deficiency, not zero. There's dust there. It's, it's, tend to get, it's, it's not, not detected here, but it's, mu it's about a factor of 10 lower surface density of dust in the center versus the highest density uh, rings out here at about 10, 11 kiloparsec. And again, if we average over the annual eye to get the most reliable results, we seem to have an a pretty good description by an exponential from about 10 kiloparsecs out to 25 with a scale length of th now 3.8 kiloparsecs describing it. Can you explain again how the, the triangles are you pixelate, then you as azimuthally average. The other one is you azimuthally average, then you pixelate. You would think those would give basically the same answer. If it were a linear model, it would, but the modeling is not, is not a linear thing. You know, we're, we're adjusting starlight intensities for, for the different ones, so the different pixels will have different starlight intensities heating them. Um, well, I think the, well, I think you should believe both of them when they agree. And when they, when they disagree, when you're falling down here, it's because, remember, I'm so, when, when I'm falling down below here, it's because a fra an increasing fraction of the pixels are not being counted. So out in this region here, beyond 15 kiloparsecs, in an annulus, when I, do the, when I make the colored triangles here, I'm only summing over the pixels where I felt I could model. But many of the pixels are not meeting my modeling threshold, but it doesn't mean there's no emission there. It just means I don't have high enough signal to noise to model the dust in that pixel. Okay, so uh, the total dust mass that we estimate using, using the model parameters is about uh, 50 million solar masses of, of dust, most of it in the inner region. So, you know, there's dust out here. It's not a trivial amount of material, but most of the dust is interior to about 15 kiloparsecs. And if you just took those red and uh, blue dots on the right-hand side of the figure and scaled by that thing you had on the previous plot of the fraction of pixels, that were counted, it'd, so you assume that... It'd that be about right, yeah. But, but, but also notice there's some crazy things oh, happening yeah. out here. You know, a few of these pixels out here are wildly off because, you know, we chose our threshold for where we could model at a relatively low surface brightness. You know, we may be picking up external galaxies in those, in those pixels, so when we get out to the outer regions here, we're not sure one of, the, one of these pixels might just be a distant galaxy that we don't quite see as a, as a galaxy, but uh, we're including it as infrared emission. And it could be a different temperature or different dust surface density um, in that galaxy or in that pixel from the external galaxy than what we would have gotten from the smooth distribution in M31. Okay, so um, we did a dust model I just showed you. Now, we also have independent observations of gas. So the modeling of the dust, I want to remind you, was done only using infrared data, only using 3.6 to 500 micron information. Nothing else prejudiced the, the, the modeling. We came out with a map of dust surface density. But now we can go to the radio astronomers and say, OK, where do you think the gas is? And how, what do you think? Can you make for us a, a map of the gas surface density? Well, with 21 centimeters, that's a pretty reliable way to get the, tw the H1 surface density. You sometimes have to worry about optical depth effects. They can be a small correction, but basically you're seeing the emission from, from the atomic hydrogen, and we know how to go from the, from the line flux to the surface density. That's a reliable calculation. The molecular hydrogen is, of course, hard to track. Here our handle on the molecular hydrogen is the CO1 to 0 line, and that's not going to be a perfect estimator for a number of reasons. We know that there's a regime of forming molecular gas in, the, in a galaxy like ours, or, or M31, where the gas can actually have the atomic hydrogen converted to molecular hydrogen, but still have very little carbon monoxide in it if, in the outer layers of a cloud. So there's, there is a regime here where CO will not detect the molecular hydrogen may, that may be there. We are going to assume that's a small correction and, and just follow the standard prescription, which is done 
innumerable times in every issue of the APJ of saying, oh, we have a CO surface brightness map. We'll multiply it by a constant to get a molecular hydrogen surface density map. That's what we've done here because we don't have any, any other way to handle this um, for M31. So that's the, the map that's been done. Now, it's not a severe problem for M31 because M31, as far as we can tell, does have most of its gas in atomic form. So yes, we're making errors with the molecular hydrogen, but that's not a major part of the mass budget to begin with, and the errors are probably not very severe. But if they are severe, maybe we'll see something strange here in a moment. So um, here's our map of the observed gas, map of the dust. Let's take the ratio of this map to that map, and we have a map of the dust to gas ratio. So we're just going to divide one by the other. Uh, I don't remember the number and I don't want to make it up. It's not, it's, it, it's sometimes, there are some regions that are dominated by the molecular gas in individual pixels, but it's not a global uh, dominance. Is, is there dust in clouds? Well, every, we're not worrying about the actual geometric distribution within a pixel. We're just summing up over the emission, the emission from each pixel. There, the dust, the gas and dust are presumably inhomogeneously distributed in that pixel, but it's all optically thin. In terms of the infrared emission, now the, the CO radiated transfer is not actually optically thin, but those are horrors that we don't want to you know, think too much about. Okay, so I'm going to take this map, divide it by that map, let's see what we get. That's what we get. Now, I'm going to remind you, you know, there was a lot of structure, detailed, you know, complex morphological structure in both of these maps, you know, rings and you know, irregularities. It's, to me, it's remarkable the degree to which that disappears in the ratio map. So we must be getting something reasonably right in terms of where we see more dust, there is more gas, and when we divide the, the dust by the gas, we end up with something that has a strong gradient. So there's plenty of, there's plenty of structure in this image, but it's basically radial structure. The, the center is very high, the outer part is very low, but aside from modeling here, you don't see big morphological features that you might have thought would be associated with spiral arms or, or rings in the galaxy. You can find them there, so this is not, we haven't perfectly removed them. But the first order, what you see here is a radial variation. Here is a distribution of the single pixel determinations of the dust to gas ratio. So dividing the dust surface density by the gas surface density and, and individual pixels and plotting every pixel on this map as a function of its galactocentric uh, distance. Here's what you see, the, 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 the central line here is the mean averaged over some you know, small bin and radius here, and these are more or less the you know, plus or minus one sigma uh, variations. So there's a clear trend of the decrease in the dust to gas ratio, at least as we estimate it, from the center to the edge. And individual pixels are following this trend with a few, you know, wild outliers here. So, that, you know, it, many of these are probably cases where there was some unusual noise issue or some background subtraction problem. Um, but, the, you know, there are a lot of pixels here and relatively few of them outside this plus or minus one range until you get out to the very low surface brightness. So when, you're, when the pixels are more and more down near your, our surface brightness limit threshold, then you see wild results here because we could re really be getting the mass wrong for one of these pixels. So for instance, suppose the one of our flux levels was unusually high for say 160 microns in the outer part. We say, wow, that dust must be really very hot in order to be able to radiate it that wavelength. So we don't need very much dust in that pixel to explain the, 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 the data at longer wavelengths. And that could be just a result of an, air, of an upward fluctuation in the surface brightness in one band. Um, is it meaningful to talk about errors associated with these uh, the measurements here? I don't. Measurements I don't think so. Not not when you not when you look uh, not when you look very closely at the data. You just you don't understand the errors at all. As I said, the the, the PACS and and MIPS data sets, they're just not compatible. And I can show you comparisons later later on. We got some some of the many of the people in the team were from the PACS team, and they were. We got some flack when we wanted to put in an appendix comparing PACs to MIPS. They didn't want to see this comparison in print, but uh, we... That's why we use distributions of intensity. But again, remember the dust temperature, the temperature of a dust grain, of the larger dust grains, you know, the 0.1 micron, they're only going as, 
you know, one-sixth power of the starlight intensity. So varying the starlight intensity by factors of 1.5 is, is not having a big issue. Okay, so I, Tim is telling me I've got to move on here. Okay, so here's the dust to gas ratio, which I just showed you, but now with two more things on the plot. So we've, the, the green line and the blue symbols are determinations by the other team that had a, a Herschel observations of Andromeda. They call themselves Hel <coughs> Helga for Herschel Exploration of Local Galaxy Andromeda. We didn't have an acronym, we just... <laughs> uh, anyway, the, so the Helga team wrote two papers and used different methods of estimating the dust to gas ratio and, you know, we're more or less in agreement with them. Uh, we don't wildly disagree. Um, we, I think we have better resolution and I think more reliable method, but we're in, in agreement. But now I want to show you something about the metallicity. Okay, so here now I've taken our determinations, again, three different, uh, two different methods, the, the, SPAR, the, the MIPS 160 resolution and the, uh, the annular averaging method. Um, that's the, the black circles and the red symbols. Now this blue line here is a determination of the oxygen abundance in the galaxy based on observations, spectroscopy of H2 regions plus modeling to try to estimate the oxygen abundance in the H2 region, taken from a paper by Zurita and Bresselin published a couple years ago. Now the solid part of this line is the region in the galaxy where they were able to use what are called weak line methods for modeling the abundances in H2 region. What that means is, if those of you who have thought about modeling the abundances in H2 region, you, you have to know the temperature of the gas in order to figure out how much of, the, of, say, oxygen you need in the gas to explain the strength of the emission line. Getting the gas temperature is always a, a big uncertainty, and the best way to do it, theoretically, would be if you can observe weak lines from, from higher levels in the oxygen which would provide a single species with one abundance giving you emission from two different levels that gives you a, a, a handle on the temperature. But the, some of those lines are weak. That hence is called the weak line method. And you can only do that if the weak line is strong enough to measure. So that limits you in, where, in the galaxy as to where this method is practical. And uh, that's the region where their method for determining the temperature is most reliable. Outside, here the lines are getting weaker and weaker overall to measure and you can't even do the even the strong lines are weak and in the inner part the gas temperature determinations the gas is too cool to excite the higher level and so again the weak line is too weak to measure and the method they then they use other methods to estimate the temperature so this is the region where the where the the, the, uh, the metal abundances determinations are most reliable but the authors of this paper said you know here's an overall description across the galaxy that we think is consistent with all the different data sets. So the first order, I'd say, our dust to gas ratio is tracking the metals to hydrogen ratio very nicely, as though a constant fraction of the metals is being retained in dust in the galaxy. Now, in the central region, we disagree. But again, that's a region where the, the spectroscopic techniques, spectroscopic analysis techniques for the H2 regions are actually unreliable. So maybe we're right and they're wrong. Maybe the metallicities actually are higher. And in the very outer part of the galaxy, our metallicities, our dust to gas ratios do seem to be falling off. Maybe that's an indication that in the very outer parts of Andromeda, a smaller and smaller fraction of the heavy elements is being able to be maintained in dust grains, as you would expect if destruction is beating uh, grain reformation in the outer parts. So, um, Does that number 0.0091 depend upon what you assume the solar metallicity to be? Uh, yes, yes. So that's the stand, you know, again, there are uncertainties about these things. Um, and given the time, we probably shouldn't talk very much about it here. But yes, uh, everything to here does depend on reference levels. Now, I'm going to give you a warning here. So this, this looked to me like wonderful agreement. I mean, I think it does look to me like wonderful agreement. But I think there is an overall scale factor uncertainty in our modeling, which I'm going to come to, which now Planck has made clear, at least made clear to me, that our mod the models we're using, which were successful in many ways in reproducing phenomena, um, I think there's a systematic error in the models based, and it was, all goes back to our assumptions about the data that was used to uh, normalize the model initially. We basically don't know very much a priori about the far infrared opacities of dust grains. The opacities we're using here seem to work pretty well, but I think there's an overall 
scaling issue, which will come to, which I'll mention without being able to uh, explain very much about. Okay, so just tell you about a few other things we're able to describe. So the model had dust in it that was being heated by starlight. So I showed you maps of the dust surface density. But the dust surface density times the starlight heating it is proportional to the infrared brightness density. And we can now, here's a map of the, dust, of the, inf of the starlight heating rates as a function of position in the galaxy. So very high starlight heating rates in the center, very low at the edge, as you'd expect. Everything's going down in the outer parts. Um, actually, one thing I didn't mention here, which I said I was going to say something about. OK, so I was very worried when we did our infrared observations and said, gee, there's this missing stuff down here. Look at the H1 map. There's just a deficiency of gas there. Something happened to Andromeda to knock a, knock a hole in this, what is now the southwest uh, edge of Andromeda. I don't have an explanation of this, but it looks like some violence has been done to the galaxy, perhaps a result of an interaction with, a, with, a, with a, another local group member, perhaps something else. But uh, notice that you know, once we saw this, we felt much better about this. Okay. Well, this is a very big structure. We're talking about you know, the outer you know, th a, a couple kiloparsecs uh, in extent over the surface of the galaxy. Uh, OK, so uh, starlight, or starlight heating rate, so the, the heating intensities. One would be the value that we think appropriate to the solar neighborhoods. So that's this, this uh, green, dark green shade. So the you know, solar neighborhood value here is about the value we find halfway out in Andromeda. Now I want to stress here that the center, the surface dense, the, 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 the starlight heating rate as inferred, we're using the dust grains as photometers as it, is, as it were. So nature has provided these photometers, scattered them through Andromeda, and if we look at the, the way they glow in the infrared, we can try to figure out what the starlight intensity is that's heating them, assuming we know the properties of the photometers. Um, and we have very high starlight intensity at the center, evidently, uh, based on this. And that's not at all surprising, because there's a galactic bulge. There's a bulge population in the center of Andromeda. And we actually know a lot about that bulge. It's been studied as a dynamical component of Andromeda. The surface brightness has been measured. The three-dimensional distribution of the stars in the, in, the, in the bulge has been estimated quite reliably. The spectrum of the stars in the bulge has been measured over a wide range of wavelengths. So we, we actually can calculate the radiation field in the center because there's not very much dust there. And the rest of the galaxy, I said, oh, I don't know how to calculate the radiation field because it's a, it's a radiative transfer problem. I'd have to know where the stars are and where the dust is. Well, in the center of, M, of M31, we know where the stars are. And there's so little dust, we don't have to worry about it as a reddening agent. So we can calculate, just do the integrals for the assumed 3D distribution of stars and calculate the starlight intensity from the bulge contribution. And that's what this curve here is. So this, func this, this dashed line here is what we think the starlight intensity should be from the bulge stars alone. Now, out in the you know, 5 kiloparsecs out, that's not an important component. The starlight in the galaxy is brighter than that because there are plenty of stars that aren't bulge stars contributing. But if you get to the central uh, kiloparsec, you're completely dominated by the bulge. So that's a region where we can test our dust model because now we know what the starlight intensity should be. And we can ask whether our photometers are reporting the right value. And in fact, they don't do exactly the right value here. So um, what we seem to see is that the best fit would be the, star the bulge intensity we think should be there is this. What the starlight is, uh, the, the infrared emission from the dust is giving us is this. We're a little bit low. Now, some of that is because of finite angular resolution. But that doesn't explain the discrepancy out here. It looks like we're underestimating the actual starlight intensity by about 30%. Hey, I was very happy with that. That's, that's a good test uh, of the model, because I didn't have any confidence that the calibration would be, be would be as good as it was. But it also indicates that we may be a little bit off systematically. OK, so the pH abundance time is uh, just about up. OK, so let me just, just say. The pH abundance is, does seem to show some variations. This is now a fraction of the dust mass in each region that is in the form of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. We see evidence of them all the way out to 20 kiloparsec, although there are artifacts in the, as I said, in the 6 and 8 micron images. I don't believe this low number out here, but I don't know how to correct for it either. Uh, to first order is constant. So let me say no more about that. Now I, want, I do want to show you the Planck observations. 
So all the imaging, all the modeling we did here was based only on Herschel and Spitzer data. We had no Planck data on M31 available to us. Uh, Planck has since come out with a paper on the on <coughs> images of M31 at Planck resolution in all of the Planck bands. And here is an image from their paper showing uh, from 28 gigahertz uh, up, up to here, these are Planck bands. And then this is IRAS 100 micron, IRAS 60 microns, and I think IRAS 24 microns. Um, so these are all Planck data that were averaged and are outside the wavelength range uh, of our modeling. Here is the paper from the Planck, from the, this is from the same Planck paper showing how they model their emission. Low frequencies, they're, you know, these are ground-based observations going below here. Synchrotron dominated at the Planck and W, they also have WMAP data on here. Planck and WMAP data in this region are predominantly free-free and synchrotron emission. Maybe a little bit of a bump here from uh, so-called anomalous microwave emission. <laughs> But at shorter wavelengths, they're seeing what they interpret as a combination of an upward fluctuation in the microwave background and then thermal dust emission. And this is their model for the thermal dust in Andromeda. Now, our model, how does it compare? Well, that curve which I plotted there is just summing up the emission which, we, which had already been calculated for our model based only on the observations from 500 microns shortwards. So using no, none of the wavelengths that are available to Planck, the model already had dust opacities in it that were informed by previous observations by COBE of dust in the solar neighborhood. And you know, my conclusion here is the model has actually done very well. So we're basically reproducing what Planck says the dust contribution is uh, in Andromeda from a model that was, that was in a sense predicting it, but using previous observations by COBE of galactic dust to tell us what the frequency dependence of dust opacity is. But no adjustments made to our model to plot it there. Okay, now one last thing here. So the Planck, I'm, I'm just about, I'm, I'm out of time, I think, but I just want, this is now a caveat. So all of this was based on a dust model that was the best one that we knew how to work with, and we like to test it with, at every opportunity, and there's been a very beautiful test done using Planck data in a recent paper uh, where Gonzalo Anyano was actually the corresponding author, where Planck data was used to tell us what the infrared emission Planck and IRAS data is. But then each point on the sky, the model is now predicting a surface density of dust and therefore predicts a, re a surface density of dust, re a, a dust reddening for distant objects. Now, SDSS has observed many quasars. So there's about 270,000 spectroscopically confirmed SDSS quasars. Every one of them is a little bit different, but as a class, they have characteristic colors as a function of redshift. And so you can ask whether with that large number of quasars, are the quasars that fall behind patches in the sky where the model said there would be more dust, are they systematically redder? And the answer is yes, they are systematically redder. Are they redder by the amount that we said they would be? No. We overpredicted the reddening of these of these of the dust uh, by the dust. So evidently, we have something wrong with our long wavelength dust opacity, which is what really is determining the surface density of dust. That's something we know how to fix now that we have another a handle to calibrate it. It's this is now going to be our best calibrator for future work on dust. So Planck has been fantastic um, as now giving us calibrations on dust models. So I think I Tim is telling me to stop yeah. or make telling me go, to go longer. No, I actually have a are these quasars in regions where you think the far infrared is dominated by galactic dust, so you have a good handle on it? And also, are they in regions of low opacity so that the reddening doesn't exert a very significant effect on your cuts that where you select the quasars for the sample? I, I, we think the answer, or the Planck team thinks the answer to both those questions is yes. Yes. Okay, so I think uh, I'll stop right here and uh, just leave this up for and ask for questions. Thank you very much. <laughs>